It's showtime! What's up, everybody? It's another week here in the wonderful world of planet Earth. Uh, I made some interesting moves this week, and this again is, I, I think, all part of my evolution. I'm going to show you what I figured out with my overlap, and this is something you might want to do. Not going to say you have to make some of the same moves, but just to be aware if you have any portfolio overlap, meaning that if you hold a stock outright, like I, well, <clears throat> instead of telling you about it, why don't I just show you guys about the little portfolio overlap spreadsheet that yours truly up in here did make. And <clears throat> we'll chop it up in the chat with all y'all after the presentation. So here we go. You guys should be able to see on the screen right now the portfolio overlap that we've got going on here. There it is. Oop, let me do this. Hold on one second, everybody, so I can make that a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Real professional, I know, right? Hey, that's the way we do it around here. So I ran through this little exercise here of not being able to make this bigger. I'm sure somebody knows how, but you will have to do, do, do. Why can I not make this bigger? This is something I should have worked out previous. Anyway, so just focus <clears throat> in here on J and J. You see, I had an overlap of five. <clears throat> I haven't updated this, by the way. I don't know how to make this bigger. There's got to be a way to zoom. Oh, right here. Everybody's like, dude, right there. There we go. There we go, everybody. So <laughs> I'm having fun. I enjoy this. I enjoy talking with you guys and seeing you every week and hearing what you're doing. So yeah, I just have this sorted from overlap. This is my taxable bridge account, the self-directed IRA. Remember, this is money. A couple years ago, I pulled 30000 from my retirement account, my 401k. It was a non-taxable event. There was like $125, I believe it was, of administrative fees. Transferred it over to Schwab to give me a little bit more control and you know play with it a little bit more. And it's grown pretty nicely. So this is the self-directed IRA account. This is the Roth IRA. Remember, this is all money that I've already paid taxes on and will never pay tax on again. Now, SCHD, this is a popular, uh, it's a popular stock that all y'all have. Uh, they have, I don't remember how many, couple hundred dividend companies. I should know that, but that's SCHD. SCHD here and DIVO, these are in the kid's wedding account. We've started a wedding account for our da teenage daughter someday to use. And I only have SCHD and DIVO in there reinvesting those dividends. But those are still accounts that I control. So yeah, so those two. And then these right here, V-I-G-A-X and V-V-I-V-I-A-X. Those are in my 401k through my employer. That is obviously all pre-tax but VIGAX is a large cap growth fund and VVIAX is a large cap value. So that's going to be a lot of dividend paying stocks. And that's why there's way more X's in that over there. So I just wanted to see with these accounts what I had where. And there was four companies, uh, actually five that I had an overlap of because Duke I had changed uh, a couple weeks ago. So there was five companies that I had oh, five overlap of. And it's just really interesting. I went through all the holdings, made these ch check marks, these chicks right here. Yeah, <laughs> made these checks right here. So J&J, &J, Kimberly Clark, Altria, Verizon, and Duke. I had an overlap of five of, and it's just something to be aware of. It, You know, somebody on Twitter said you can never have too much J&J, &J, so they kind of pushed back on me uh, on it. But as I'm going to tell you in just a second, I think it does make sense to do this. So you can, uh, I didn't put a link in the description below on this. It's on my podcast. I'll add this when the stream's over if you want to go through and check it out. And uh, you can see there's a bunch that I have an overlap of one on. This is pretty interesting. Um, you know, the, it's not a bad thing. It's all going to be personal preference. And this was just my personal preference for you people out there. So here we go. As we look at myself on, uh, on old Canva there. <laughs> so here it is. It's a tax shelter optimization is what I am trying to do. And the whole thought, the whole thing behind this was I had overlap, right, of Johnson & Johnson. So what I wanted to do is to 
be maximizing for the or optimizing for the tax shelter status of the self-directed IRA and the Roth, meaning that companies that are domiciled in Canada, particularly the banks, there's a withholding tax. Uh, Shamir, if you're watching or anybody else, I think it's 15 percent. Now, you can get a tax credit on that if you're here in the U.S., but if you have it in a retirement account, you can pretty much skip that from what I understand and you are not subject to that withholding tax. So I wanted to hold REITs and Canadian banks inside of my retirement accounts. And I was up, as you'll see, on companies like, as we go into it, nice. Archer Daniels Midland, I sold them. This was in the self-directed IRA. I was up 103% on them. And even with that massive gain in yield on cost, the yield on cost was still about three, I think 3.03%. So, so just to over 3%, $87.17. I sold those at uh, eight shares of old ADM. Let's see here. And then what do we got next? I sold Procter & Gamble in a self-directed IRA, four shares of PNG. These are great companies. Don't get me wrong. I love them. They are stalwarts. They're just spitting out cash, but they're so big, so mature uh, that they're paying the bulk of their, their in dividends, right? The cash and dividends, their retained earnings, because uh, as Warren says, if companies can't make that dollar of returned of retained earnings, if they can't make a market return of over a dollar, they should pay it out in the form of a dividend or buy back shares, which is why like C's Candy, although they're private, they return almost all of their cash in the form of a dividend, but it's in-house, right? Because C's is private and 72 Berkshire bought them. So uh, Berkshire moves the money around and will turn that dollar into something more than a dollar. But yeah, C's in and of itself, if they were a separate company publicly traded, they would be paying out the bulk of their earnings in the form of a dividend. So kind of what some of these other big stalwarts are doing. So I sold those for, I was up 34% on Procter & Gamble. I sold at 151.36. And by the way, some of these I think are really, really overvalued. And I will be buying and adding to them if they drop inside of the bridge account, my taxable account. 14 shares of J&J &J I sold at $179.20. Yeah, it was up 21% on J&J, &J, but same thing. And they are also a company I'd like to add. The thing with pharmaceuticals is it's so difficult to predict which blockbuster drug in their pipeline is going to be that next, or which drug in their pipeline is going to be that next blockbuster. So I think when you look at pharmaceuticals, it really makes sense to try to hold a group of them that you buy at really good multiples, at really good valuations that look like they might be kind of cheap, and to hold like J&J, &J, Merck, AbbVie, Pfizer, uh, Gilead, companies like this, Eli Lilly, just to hold a group of them because we don't know. And I, I think it's really difficult to know which of those drugs in their pipeline is going to be another blockbuster. So anyway, J&J &J, up 21%. I think it's a little overvalued. Uh, the dividend was, I don't even think it was, it was a pushing about 3%. Uh, with what I had my yield on cost, I believe. And yeah, I just, I did some better things with that money, as you'll see here. And the last one I sold, McDonald's. I only had four little shares, up 43%. Sold those at 265.82 on good old McDonald's. I do like McDonald's. I know some people like Killer Zentra there, not at your cup of tea. But uh, I will look to add companies like this if we do have like a capitulation event when the market is crashing. And here's what I bought as we... Bring it on home, everybody. We bought two more shares of Vici. Not a lot. I think they're a little bit, uh, I, th I think they can come down in price a little bit more and I'd like to get them, but I had eight shares. I wanted to bump that up to an even 10, kind of that starter position. Uh, bought those at 31.93. The, um, the yield on cost, or the, not the yield on cost, the current starting yield, that's what this green number is, is 4.91%. So, Thinking about selling stuff like Archer Daniels, J&J, &J, right around 3%. So, yeah, I'm getting an extra uh, a couple percentage points. But I think in the long run, these also have more upside. Yeah, they're not as solid as the stalwarts, but 
buying stuff also like Life Storage. This is a company, and if you guys want, we can talk about it more in depth. Uh, I mentioned on the podcast, I'm, dude, I'm so, so very uh, comfortable and knowledgeable about Life Storage. I work for them. We're a subcontractor. I've seen the business for a few years now, and I've been watching this, and they're at 52-week lows, almost a 5% dividend yield. Uh, I bought, I think, three or four different tranches. If you want to find out the exact tranches I bought, I'll share that in the newsletter. So that is linked below. You also get, you know, my book, uh, Brief Thoughts on Life, Love and Investing, free, free PDF download with that. Uh, 96.36 was the average this week of those 22 shares of life storage and almost a 5% current yield right now. So the shares I bought, uh, a bulk of them were over 5% on life storage. And then I bought, went heavy into TD Bank, Toronto Dominion up there in Canada. Again, like we said, just utilizing that tax sheltered status of the accounts because I'm not going to have to deal with the Canadian withholding tax as I understand it. Uh, 25 shares of TD. Love them because they are not just, they don't have a lot of exposure to like investment banking. They make a lot of their money on just simple loans like home loans, auto loans, uh, commercial small business loans, stuff like that. So TD uh, bought, I think, three tranches of that. But the average uh, for the week, $65.56, 4.4% uh, current uh, starting yield on TD. And then to bring it on home, just because I had five shares and it's a stupidly high 8% uh, current starting yield on Altria, um, yeah, tobaccos, we know where, what's the deal with that. They're trying to transition to smokeless and heat, not burn technology. But I bought five shares at $45, which was a higher. This is the current yield right now is 8.09. That's not the yield on cost on those. So that's what I did. What do you guys think about it? What do you think um, about all that with uh, with my buying, my selling, I sold P and <laughs> Procter and Gamble, McDonald's, J and J, Archer Daniels Midland, some solid companies. But I did. Um, oh, dude, nice. There we go, Mr. Bob Wright. What's up, Bob? I didn't salute you guys. What's up? He took profits in J and J and PG. Still holds McDonald's for the long term, but not adding. Yeah, I I agree, man. And I. I will be adding, I'd love to add more J&J. Uh, &J. Actually, while we're talking about it, why don't we look at the intrinsic value um, of J&J? Because &J, I don't remember what it is or what it was. So we'll go over to Alpha Spread <clears throat> and look at the intrinsic value of that J&J. &J. Oh, by the way, here, I had TD up. So yeah, Toronto Dominion. Um, I can blow that up a little bit or not. Oh my God, you blew it up too much. It's too much, guy. Ninety-five dollars uh, is the base case valuation, <clears throat> and this is if all things are are just even keel, steady Eddie for the next five years. Is this? And uh, gr uh, granted, everybody, it's so subjective. Intrinsic valuation. When you see that ninety-five, don't ever think that that is the number. All intrinsic valuation is, is a range and it's completely subjective. I know some people don't like to use it because they say it's like looking through the Hubble telescope. If you turn it a quarter of an inch, you're looking at a completely different galaxy. So it's very subjective and it's just a range. It's, it's like I say, it's kind of like knowing somebody needs to lose weight without knowing exactly how much they weigh. But the worst case on uh, TD, dude, this is why I've been buying $76.40, meaning it's about 16% undervalued. And just the discounted cash flow value puts it at about $79, which is a 19%. Dude, it's just good. It's just good stuff. But, but why I brought you along here. Let me see. J and J. The intrinsic value on Johnson and Johnson, as we're looking here. Is my mic loud? Let me know. Right here. This is one of the reasons. So base case, they say $141. So it's about 22% overvalued. So there you go. But for me personally, if I see J and J around $150 a share, I would like to buy it there. So again, intrinsic value is just a range. And the worst case. $118. That's five years of negative growth. I don't foresee that for J&J, &J, but hey, you know, anything is uh, possible over there. So interesting, Bob. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rick, this one's for you, buddy. I'm going <laughs> to. That sounded a little cruel, huh? This one's for you, buddy. Uh, some news out on EPD. I'm going to show you as soon as I get my wits about me and figure out. <laughs> it's always an adventure around here. Uh, let's see. No, this is what I want to share. This is what I want to do. Oh, yeah. Bank of Ozark raised their dividend. Check this out. Uh, is anybody a, a ticker OZK, uh, Bank of Ozark uh, investor, little regional bank? They have 50 consecutive quarterly increases. They're trying to be, as I said, the realty income of the regional banks. So they're at a 3.36% yield. But yeah, 50 consecutive quarterly increases for OZK. But here, EPD, check it out, man. Uh, Enterprise raised their dividend 3.2%, which marks the 24th straight year of annual growth and a 7.84% yield. They get a safety score of 65. Again, also, this is not gospel, these safety scores. So uh, Enterprise raised their dividend 3%. So very nice. A very, very nice. Uh, let's see, Steve, he only bought Altria this week. That's two of us, buddy. Uh, yeah. Which Steve? I don't remember. Are you the Steve that brought up? Um, no, it's not you. It's the other Steve. We have a couple Steves around here. It's like uh, multiplicity right around here with all these names. Let's see. Um, yeah, Bob also did mostly selling. Very interesting. Do you think that's because the market's going lower? And let's see, Kevin. I think I saw Ryan in here. I'm going to try and not be like Ryan and be 20 minutes behind the comments. So watch this. Okay. Hello, Kevin. Uh, we got Chris from Israel. Dude, have you hooked up with Ari? Uh, Ari Gutman. Gutman? Ari Gutman. Check out his YouTube channel. He is in Israel as well right now. Um, all right, let's see. Let's see, let's see. Are you all here? What's, what's, oh my God, I almost did the, <laughs> who is that, Gomer Pyle? Uh, let's see. The Roth contribution now 6,500. Yeah, they bumped it up so we get to contribute more. Uh, that's you guys. Let's uh, <laughs> what's up, Ryan? I don't know if you're working out. I don't know if you want to hop on, chat with me, whatever. Uh, yeah, not empty. No, dude, I got I got volleyball tournament after this. My daughter, it's one of those all day things. Like could be seven hours. So all the volleyball you can handle. All right, I'm getting caught up. Look at this. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. All right, you guys are talking. Yeah, Bob also saying Vici's a good REIT. You know what? Vici is like the Mr. Furley. Shout out if you know who Mr. Furley was, but Vici's like the Mr. Furley of the Vegas Strip. I'll just tell you, he's the landlord on Three's Company, and most of you are probably still like, huh? Um, yeah, so Vici bought MGM Growth Properties, ticker MGP. So there was kind of a opco how do you call it? Opco, Propco. So split. That means the operating company and the property split into two different entities. So that happened because Caesars went into bankruptcy, right? I believe. So Caesars split into Caesars, which I think ticker CZR, and then into Vici. So the gaming operator rents the property. They pay rent to Vici, ticker VICI. And the same thing happened, but I don't believe it was because of bankruptcy was uh, MGM. They have MGM Gaming or whatever it's called now. And uh, MGM Growth Properties was ticker MGP. And then Vici bought MGP. So they are massive. They own the bulk of the Vegas Strip. And uh, yeah, shout out to Ryan, who is out there in Vegas. And interesting, there was that, I tweeted out that report. Um, that Landon Buildings put out. They are a 3% stakeholder in Six Flags, which has been doing awful. Uh, I was just had uh, Harris Malberg report that he went to Six Flags in Austin, I think over the summer last year, and he said it was awful. He said it was stuff was broken down, dirty, just sad to see. Uh, I remember Six Flags Great America up here in Gurney. Uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, right outside of Chicago. Chicago. It was uh, always a fun place to go to, but now it's just, anyway, so uh, Landon Buildings wants to push companies like Vici, who had said they expressed interest in buying amusement parks. They want them to go to do that Opco-Propco split, except uh, 
Vici has said they well not Vici's not pushing it but Vici would like to get into the amusement parks and start branching away out from uh casinos which I think could be really lucrative really interesting um they could even do we won't get into it sales lease back uh let's see clown and uh, if that's for me so yeah if you missed it watch the beginning I did sell Procter and Gamble and anyone who helps who just turned in at, at the beginning uh, I I'm by the way I do that for people that might find the video a couple weeks from now so they don't have to this is all just for us I, I love hanging out with you guys but it might not replay that well a couple weeks from now so I kind of front load like all the information at the beginning but um yeah, I did sell Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, and McDonald's just in the retirement account. And I still hold them in many other places. So it's going to be okay uh, is what I did. Let's see here. Who else am I going to get to? Da, 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 da. Yeah, let me know what you guys bought. What'd you sell? I'd like to know. Let's see. How much life storage pay for dividend? Good question. If you want to know exactly, I will show you because I don't know off the top of my head. I guess I should know those numbers, right? Uh, let's share the entire screen, because I'm also going to give you the intrinsic value of uh, alpha spread, by the way. Or um, and close that. That was my presentation. That was my presentation, everybody. Um, oh, by the way, J&J, &J, look at this. They declared their next dividend. Oh, load up. There we go. Dollar thirteen. So that right there, April of last year is when they did their increase. They announced it. So probably this is the last before their next dividend increase for um, J and J Johnson Johnson. Let's, let's blow that down. <laughs> if you blow it up, can you also blow it down? That's Popeye. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Um, so yeah, that yield is four point ninety eight percent. And they pay $1.20 per quarter, $4.80. And I think, yeah, during the last recession, they had cut it, the GFC. But currently, 6% five-year uh, CAGR. And it's been uninterrupted for 11 years. And again, those are non-qualified dividends. So you're paying your ordinary income tax rate, which is why I love holding them in the trying to optimize and think more long-term about optimizing for taxes and really utilizing what that's there for. So I think that's why I think LSI will serve a better purpose in the retirement account than a J&J &J or a PG, just because of I'm up so much on them. And also the dividends are qualified. So it's, you know... Uh, but yeah, there it goes, $1.20. And what I also liked about them is that yield is 28% above the five-year average. Again, <laughs> they're squarely at the bottom of the 52-week price range. And this number is what we look at here, the adjusted funds from operation payout ratio, only 76%. So really solid. They have just not, not a lot of um, net debt either, only 46% net debt. Just, I think they're just a solid company uh, is life storage. And the reason that I really wanted to go heavy now is they've been dropping and I decided to pull the, tr <laughs> pull the trigger, so to speak, is this. So they have a base case intrinsic value of $114. So about 16% undervalued. And the bear case, five years of negative growth, they still give about $103 of intrinsic value. So uh, I was happy to pick up life storage there, start a position, and I'm going to probably just keep buying into them. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you guys are chatting about there. So let's see. I'm going to try and work through to some questions here because you guys can chat. Feel free to chat amongst yourself too. And please scroll through the Simply Save Dividend News. Yeah, I did that. Um, I, I mean, I did that later. I don't know how far you wanted to go back, but or maybe I didn't do it last. That was it. There was only three little news articles. So that was pretty much the most of it. Professor Joe, what's up, man? Thank you for coming back. Uh, AT&T and PEBO. Is that people's, I don't know. What is PB, P E B O. I got to look that up. Um, I think it's people's bank, right? Oh no. Yeah. People's bank corp. Bank corp. They have a big current undervaluation right now. If anybody wants to see that, I'll share it for you, Professor Joe. 
will show you the intrinsic value. Why is he singing? I don't know. He sings because he wants to sing. I'm happy. I'm happy to talk to you guys. Uh, here. Anyway, back to business. Focus. $55.76. Intrinsic value in the base case. Looking pretty cheap. And the intrinsic value for worst case, $37.86. That is uh, looks definitely, and it's below the discounted cash flow value. So that is definitely solid. You like to see that. So interesting stock. Anybody else own Peebo? Not Peebo Bryson, or uh, does anyone else remember Peebo Bryson? Or is it just me? Let's see. Let's see. Um, trying to get to your guys' questions here. If you have questions, you want to ask me anything, shoot, shout it out. I don't care. Comments, questions, concerns, whatever you have to say. Uh, actually, a little bit of news and update on our European trip. I think we're just going to go to Ireland and maybe England this year and then do uh, Central Europe, like Prague and Germany next summer. So uh, we're going to dip our toes out there in Ireland. I was already looking. There's a punk bar called Thomas House in Dublin. Punk, metal, rockabilly. It looks like it's two floors. That's what I'm looking at. I got my face-to-face -face shirt on. And <laughs> What did you say, Chris? Uh, only buy was Walmart. Interesting, buying Walmart. Okay, yeah. And here we go. Steve's the uh, you, <laughs> he's the URNM guy. I'm sorry, dude. It's um, yeah. So URNM is the Sprott Uranium uh, ETF. They have companies that hold uh, uranium, mine uranium, do anything. The bulk of their operations have to be with uranium. And I had bought it because. One of the world's largest producers of uranium is Kazatomprom, and they're out there in Kazakhstan. Or Kazakhstan? That's where Borat was from, fictional Borat. But uh, anyway, they had a really nice yield the last couple of years. So I, I guess I think I may have been guilty about also going after the yield. 0.86% expense ratio, a little bit high. So they didn't pay a dividend. There was no distribution this year. I was like, what the heck? Emailed uh, Sprott and Sprott got back to me and said that there was no earnings or capital gains for the fund. So therefore there was nothing to distribute. But crazily, they did a two for one stock split and my 10 shares became 20. So uh, they ran up a little bit. URNM did. And I'm going to exit that. That's also in the, in the retirement account. I have like... I think $34.40 is my average. It's at like 33.40 ish right there now. So next week I got my sell order for 34.50, 10 cents on each share. I'm gonna get out and use that money to just I'm just gonna go more into um oh BHP. What do you guys like about BHP group? I know Matt Money, when I was on with Ryan and him, talked about BHP having exposure. Oh, he didn't, but I, I've come across that BHP has exposure to uranium mining. So uh, there's Cameco CCJ, ticker CCJ up in Canada and BHP. So I think I'm going to look into those and let's see, let's see. Chris Parisano, Chris Parisano. He loves Vici. You wish he stacked up a lot more. Yeah, man. My yield on cost on Vici is pretty low as well. And let's see here. I'll tell you in just a second. My yield on cost. What's your guy's yield on cost on Vici? Shout it out if you got it while I'm stalling and buying time while I'm looking here. Uh, my yield on cost on Vici is 6%. And my average price is $25.79. So I would love to buy it back around there. Um, we'll see. But like I said, I just grabbed those couple more shares to get me up to 10 Uh the run-up of VZ had this week. Honestly, Steve, I know it was comments by the CEO, right? I didn't get a chance to look into that. So I honestly don't know exactly what was said. So I'd love if any of you did. Um, Portugal, dude, I love that. What's up, Paulo? Wasn't the alchemist, wasn't the alchemist set in Portugal or was the writer from Portugal from the alchemist? Really cool book. I like the alchemist. Not to be confused with The Richest Man in Babylon, which is a book you guys should all be reading. If you haven't read The Richest Man in Babylon, either go to your library, download it. It's probably even on YouTube for free. It's a really cool book. And it's it's one of the early books that everybody likes because it really drives home the point of underspending your income. If you want to be wealthy, you it's, it's non-negotiable unless... 
somebody's going to just dump millions of dollars in your lap. You're going to have to underspend your income, whether you're at the bottom or you're at the top. And I know there's poor people that are make $500,000 a year and they spend $550,000 a year. They're living paycheck to paycheck. Crazy to say that, but nice app harvest. I have no idea what app harvest is. Is that a, um, well, it wouldn't be foreign to you. It would be foreign to me. Interesting. Let's see. Uh, hey, Phil, though. Oh, interesting. Apple, Microsoft, T. Rowe, Kroger, and Walgreens. Do you have any concerns with Apple and Microsoft in a potential recession that's coming? Microsoft, I um, I know some people are worried that there's going to be a slowdown big time with Microsoft because companies, they buy lease or they lease software from Microsoft that they provide for employees. But when we're downsizing and there's a lot of people losing their jobs, then those um, that software that was bought for those employees to use is not going to be renewed and it's going to be less revenue for Microsoft. So, right, I think Satya Nadella, the uh, Microsoft uh, CEO, has said that it's going to be an interesting, I don't know if he said rough, but I think he alluded to it's going to be a little bit of a rough uh, or uncertain bumpy next couple of years. So um, nice. Uh, life storage and EXR, that's extra space storage. Um, I've never really looked into extra space. I will, t- let me see, I'll tell you off the top of the um, if they're undervalued here, at least as much as life storage. But yeah, I don't, I, I'm not really going to do much of an a, um, analysis on one. I, so they're saying extra space is about fairly valued right now. Uh, one thing that I do can tell you about life storage that I love is their warehouse anywhere. This I think makes them kind of unique is what life storage is doing is they want to be like mini warehousing for final mile for order fulfillment. So they're trying to branch out more than just being cubes that people put all their crap into. And I really like that about them. And like I said, I've, I've talked with people that work at life storages. Uh, they have two different, you know, company owns and there's lease, uh, there's, um, not franchisees, but lessees, you know, kind of like McDonald's does. So the corporate runs a percentage of them. Um, oddly enough here in Chicago, we don't get, we're getting a lot of the corporate work, but the ones that are leased can use different vendors, whoever they want to choose. So that's, um, yeah, but anyway, interesting stuff that they, they'll, companies can ship stuff and it has RFID tracking on all of the merchandise and then they can fulfill it from the life storage and ship it out to somewhere that's closer to that life storage facility. A um, lot of truck parking too there. So even if uh, there's a lot of semi drivers, right, that live in a neighborhood and they don't have anywhere to put their truck. So part of when they own their rig, they own their tractor, they need to park that somewhere if they can't park it at their house. So it's it's kind of cool. There's several around Chicago that I've been to that what they do in life storage takes these old buildings, like hundred year old factories. And instead of having them being knocked down, life storage just moves in. They retrofit them. They put their paint on the outside. They upkeep it. They put in all of those little storage units, but then there's usually like big yards outside. Boom. They lease that out (laughs) more money. Uh, You have a lot of semis, uh, food trucks will park there. Limos will park there. Anything that's like large storage also to park that, but you'll see these drivers, like they take their personal car to their tractor and then they start it up and they pull out of the yard. So they pay life storage a fee for that. Now paying me a fee for that. Uh, Let's see. Kevin's still working on getting 100 shares of Cisco. Yeah, they've run up. I, I'd like to see them a little bit lower. Um, I had that covered call that those shares got called away, but I put the bulk of that into Target. I was buying Target again. It That's twice now since last summer. Target has bounced off of 139. It's not going below 139. So I think there's a really solid floor. And I was kind of rooting and hoping that it would uh, drop below that, but you know, I, I like Target. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, Universal, is that UVV? Is that Universal Tobacco, Paolo? Let's see. <laughs> I asked if anyone remembered Peebo Bryson. Smooth, man. See, I know. I'm all about it. About it. Uh, let's see. An email. Oh, you did. 
Dude, um, yeah, I didn't get to that, James. You know what? I think I deleted it because I, I thought it was um, – I thought it was – Put it this way, I have a lot of spam coming in too, so I'm trying to weed it out and I, I totally deleted your email, man. If you could send that again, please. But as far as, oh, borrowing a billion dollars, um, I don't, that's how they grow, right? So I know they either have to issue stock or they have to borrow, but it depends on what they're using it for. So I would totally have to look into what that's being used for. If that's being used for an acquisition, um, they do interesting stuff. All, Realty Income is trying to expand too, right? Remember with Win last year, they did that sale lease back with Win. So what they did is Win wanted to get some money. So they sold their property to Realty Income and then Realty Income right around, I think it was like a 20 year lease, maybe I shouldn't speak. It was more, it was a multi, multi year lease. So the company like Six Flags could do that. They could sell their real estate to a company like Vici and then do the lease back, then sign like a 20 year lease with Vici and then pay obviously as the operator to pay rent to Vici to be able to operate on that land. So I don't know what that was um, used for. It looks like Paulo also bought CRISPR. I know Ryan dude was big on CRISPR. I came close to buying some CRISPR in like $160, $150 a share when it was up there. And yeah, I'm glad I didn't. I didn't. Uh, about bank stocks next week for earnings. I don't know. I I guess we'll have to see. I don't like predicting the future too much. Um, but I think the banks are going to be okay. I think obviously as rates go up, this is an environment that's really going to benefit the lenders because they're going to be able to charge more and make more money on the money that they're loaning out. So I think it's going to be good for banks. And it's, you know, and the ones that have the credit card component, I know here in the United States, dude, people built up so much money from COVID, from the STEMI funds, from the stimulus checks. But yeah, people are just bad, dude. It's an American pastime to overspend your income. And it's, I think people are going to just go deeper and deeper into debt, have to borrow more, put more on the credit card. And it's so sad to see that we're not taught this. It should be beaten into our heads. Underspend your income. <laughs> if you want to be wealthy, it's, it's going to be really hard to get ahead in life. If I think the last thing I saw, credit card rates are like, what, 20%? It's going to be really hard to get ahead in life paying 20% on your debt. Very difficult to get ahead in life like that. So it's unfortunate. I think banks are going to do okay. Um, Gary, what's up, Gary? Bought Jeppy, JPQ, and PL Prologis. Too bad it doesn't roll. Like Jeppy sounds Jeppy. It's a Jeppy. But what's Jep? I bought Jeppy. Uh, let's see, Vici. Oh, nice. 2830. Jealous of my, uh, don't be too jealous because I should have been buying more. And I do remember wanting it to get it closer to 20, but, uh, this is where I get stuck. Like, um, the next one heads up, the next one to go is going to be Microsoft and the self-directed, uh, it's just been falling like a stone. So I'm waiting for a nice, you know, uh, six, $7 up day. I have two shares of Microsoft at I think $202. I started that in uh, spring 2020 and I was like, okay, when it goes under 200, I'm going to buy a lot more and it just hasn't come back down. So I wish I would have sold later, but you know, that's okay. So um, yeah, that, that's the problem though. When everything's on sale, my focus starts shifting toward those solid J and J PG again, probably target now though. And companies like Vici, they're, they don't really land on my radar because I'm looking at the big stalwarts, you know. Let's see. Ah, CCJ is buying Westinghouse, who is real. Nice, James. I did not know that, and that's really interesting. Um, yeah, Cameco is Canadian. So that's a company I would definitely – I looked at them a bit before, but let's see. Chris is Vici, 2950. I like it, guys. Let's see. Riches Babylon must read. I love it. And okay, there you go. If anybody watching, if you have not read, the, you have no excuse. The Richest Man in Babylon is on YouTube. So you don't even have to read it. It's a pretty short book. 
I don't know how long it would be on YouTube, probably a couple hours, but yeah, look at this guy. He's got the Seahawks logo veg or veg 2814. It's kind of, isn't it a weird thing? I feel like I'm speaking to robots sometimes. This is my friend veg 2814, everybody. <laughs> People be like, what did you program your friend? Let's see. 200 is a good buy. Yeah, it could be. But like I said, those two shares I have of Microsoft in the self-directed IRA. Um, oh, in uh, v, 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 I, G, A, X, in my Vanguard Mutual Fund, they are the second biggest holding behind Berkshire. So I think Berkshire, which those two funds, do we have a big chunk of our, our net worth in those two mutual funds from Vanguard, which have 0.05% expense ratios, by the way. Yeah, again, that was VVIAX and VGIAX. Those are just solid. And I was going to buy Berkshire, right? But I looked at that and this kind of what got the ball rolling. Um, I noticed Berkshire made up about 3% of the fund and Microsoft was just under them at like 3.02% or something of the fund. So turns out, and that's why I said, I have a lot of Microsoft exposure. So I think I can do something better with that money inside of the tax uh, sheltered account. Do I think Intel will reduce the dividend? Um, maybe. If they need the cash, I think they have enough. Um, honestly, that's always a, a thing of last resort that they want to reduce the div dividend because it just gives them such a stigma. Like once they start paying that dividend, you don't want to cut it because so many investors are going to bail on the stock. And uh, usually management has performance bonuses tied to the share price of the stock, which is why it shouldn't be. They should have it tied to like return on invested capital or something because man, the share price can be manipulated. There can be financial shenanigans going on with, with borrowing money, with retaining a lot of earnings. I mean, you can, you know, buying back shares at a high price. Think of Facebook dude. They were buying back shares when they shouldn't have been. So that all can artificially inflate the stock price in the short term. But all you need to know is in the long run, that's why Ben Graham, right, said in the short term, it's a voting machine. But in the long term, the market is a weighing machine and they weigh it by corporate corporate profitability. And it just follows. It's a lagging effect. It may take years sometimes, but eventually it will catch up. If a company has increasing earnings and profitability, profitability the share price is going to go up. But if they have decreasing earnings and profitability, I guess you've guessed what I'm going to say is that the share price is going to go down. It's just a fundamental law of the nature of investing. And for a short time, and sometimes that short time can be years, eventually it will catch up. And uh, yeah, so anyway, that's that's my way of saying that. I don't think they're going to reduce the dividend now. And I think that's going to be a measure of last resort. And if they do reduce that dividend, baby Pat Gelsinger is going to have to do an amazing sales job to tell people that this is just, just momentary and we're only having to do this so we can uh, get a, a little, pay down a little bit of debt. But um, I think they would only do that if the, actually, good question. Good question. Uh, let me look at one thing with you guys. I'll, the interest coverage ratio, this is something that is very, very important here, if I can get this on. So the interest coverage ratio is something that is critical for companies that, let's see, where do I, these are all my stocks in the self-directed IRA, by the way. So Intel, here we go. They say a dividend safety score of 70, but if we go to the financials here, hopefully this loads up. Thank you, Mr. Computer. Oh, interesting. Look at that. They actually have increased share count just a little bit. Uh, yeah, here we go. Sorry, guys, if this is making you dizzy, but actually I'll scroll back up on the way out. So interest coverage ratio. This is really, and as they say, uh, nice little description. It divides the operating income by the interest expenses to gauge how easily a firm can meet its interest obligations, right? The interest on the debt. If a company has significant debt, interest payments can consume most of its cash flow and potentially pressure the dividend. So right here, these numbers that you see, this 16.68 
That means they currently, Intel currently has $16.68 of operating income for every $1 of interest expense. So they can easily cover that. It's a 16 times coverage ratio of operating income. And the critical thing that you got to know is if this starts dipping low, so if they can't pay the, if a company can't pay the interest on the debt, default's going to happen. <laughs> and when default happens, bankruptcy is likely on the horizon. So if a company is forced to it, this is why I love interest coverage ratio. And I love that they show it. It's such a critical number is you have to be able to pay the interest on the debt, which Intel currently currently is able to do. So I don't think that they're going to be cutting that dividend anytime soon. But um, but as you can see here, the trend though has been coming down. I mean, we're at, it's every year, right? Every year, 49, 45, 37, 36, 16. So that number's coming down and we'll see <laughs> if it's dipping like it shows, they like to see above eight to give them the warm and fuzzy. So if that number starts to get lower, then I would get nervous and we will see. But remember for a time, a company can, you know, skate around and uh, I don't know what else I was going to say. Try I'm caught. I got caught. Dang it. I didn't get catched up on my comment. Oh, dude, Nora, what's up? Hey, uh, when, I don't know if you're, if I'm around tomorrow, maybe I'll, if you're on and I'm on, I'll pop on if, if you don't care, that'd be fun on your channel. We'll see. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm doing, I, so tomorrow's going to be busy. We have another uh, volleyball thing, but I'm going to be on with Dave up there in Toronto, speaking of Canada, on the Passive Income Podcast, doing some kind of a roundtable. I don't know what the topic is, but as you can tell, man, you just you just wind me up and I go. I'll just, I'll talk. So when I'm on with people, and this is something all you guys should know I'm I'm working on, I can get in the habit of just, just yada, 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 yada like rapid fire. And, you know, it's like, dude, take a breath. Let somebody else speak, have a conversation. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, nice to catch you live too. I did a couple weeks ago. So if I'm on and you're on next time, if it's not tomorrow, uh, I'd like to come on, chat with your your peeps there. Okay, Davey, AO. Uh, I'm not sure what that if that's a Navy thing. That's after my time, but. Uh, or dude, I don't I haven't asked you because Davy Jones, Davy Jones locker, that whole thing, the bottom of the oat. Are were you in the Navy, Mr. Davy Jones? Let me know. Um, let's see. I'm gonna get through these quick. I want to get caught up. Uh Tesla. No position on Tesla. My teenage daughter does. She just added more too. And I told her, eh, I'm not that big on the company, but she sees the cars everywhere. And it's hard to deny. But dude, did you guys see the Ram truck? Dude. Ram, Dodge Ram has their electric truck sleek. I think it makes Tesla's truck look silly, quite honestly. So uh, let's see. Going on with what you know, life storage and the rationale makes sense. Yeah, Joe. So, dude, um, that ties into, was it last week already? If you guys missed it, my wife was on with me for the whole stream uh, last week. It's the one where the, the thumbnail is the circle and I put I'm changing. Uh, and that I I just laid it out. I've been listening to all the Berkshire annual meetings. I know, crazy. I'm a lunatic. I worked late last night, and I'm driving at 8:30 at night listening to the 2008 morning session of the Berkshire shareholder meeting, and just so many good nuggets of wisdom. But yeah, Warren said, "Circle of competence, man. You have to invest in your circle of competence. And if you're not sure, then you don't have a." circle of competence and you need to know the limitations of that circle. So, uh, Walgreens and boots. Uh, I'm not that big on the boots Alliance part, but here in the U S Walgreens is, uh, they're everywhere. <laughs> they are everywhere. I think most Americans live within a five mile within five miles of a Walgreens. I believe that's the number crazy. Uh, my guy out there in Ireland, uh, Derek engineer, my freedom, part of the, the part of the second half of the, uh, dividend talk podcast. Um, he has a lot of strong feelings on Walgreens and I think he re wishes he would have gotten, um, out of it. Uh, Westinghouse. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see. Uh, adding WBA since I, and you know, share with me your guys thoughts too, like this, Joe, 
I love it. I love to hear from you guys too. I mean, I'm just an amateur like all y'all. I just, I'm the lunatic that just decided to put a camera in front of me and do the whole YouTube thing. So uh, from Portugal, Portugal, uh, increase my little 15 euro portfolio. Dude, you're welcome. And again, don't take anything I say as gospel. These are all just my opinions. And I know Darth loves, Darth Dividend loves to say, not financial advice. So we should have that like robots every 10 seconds. This is not financial advice. This is, yeah. Um, <laughs> Kevin likes Walgreens too. A lot of his shopping at Walgreens. Yeah. Uh, my wife just picked up prescriptions from Walgreens. Everybody uses it, man. I, okay, I didn't, yeah, I know, uh, aviation ordinance, man. I worked with a bunch of AOs. I didn't know if that's what he meant because I hadn't seen it spelled like that. Um, I was in the, this will be too esoteric. I was on an aircraft carrier. This guy right here, the USS John C. Stennis. CVN 74, I got out in 1999, but I was in the G4 weapons elevators division. And I was myself, I was a machinist mate, and I was with uh, electricians mates and aviation ordnance men's AOs. So all of those, uh, you know, oh, hey, if you guys watch Top Gun, I don't know if you've watched Top Gun, but you will see different colored shirts. So when you go out to sea on a naval aircraft carrier, at least, I don't know about the other vessels, but on the aircraft carrier, you wear a different shirt, different, like a long sleeve jersey shirt. And mine, we wore red. So red is for the weapons department. Um, yellow was, I don't remember. Blue was handling. I think yellow was, or blue, I don't remember. See, dude, the mind is a crazy thing. You got to take care of it. I guess my brain said we need to know more about dividends. There's limited space storage here. If it's like the, uh, I, I imagine it like the bar on the computer when it says you're getting full, I have to delete files. <clears throat> so apparently my brain has deleted the file that knew what the yellow, white, uh, and green shirts were for and blue shirts. So there's different shirts. My brain doesn't remember what those were. So we can only keep so much in our heads and, uh, Tesla has amazing margins. Yeah, that Ram though, I think it's, oh dude, you know who else? I think it was at CES. Um, Sony and Honda or Hyundai? Hyundai. Hyundai. They have a car coming out. Sony and Hyundai, I think it is. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, they, um, dude, they, uh, it's coming. That, that's all I'm saying. So Tesla's margins, though, I think are going to get squeezed. They have that first mover advantage. But, dude, everybody's coming out with an EV. And that is just so much competition. And this is what worried me about Tesla is, like, effectively, I do. I know they had some solar and whatnot. But in my mind, they are a um, – they're Honda and Sony. David Clark. Thank you, David. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Uh, CES is interesting. I, I heard they have a bird feeder that recognizes a thousand birds. It has a camera and it will tell you what birds visited your yard. So uh, I don't remember what I was talking about. It slipped it. Let's see. Totomi, SLRC. Uh, isn't that SL Green Realty Corporation? I know they cut the dividend. So I think they have too much office space. Um, let's see. SLRC. Yeah. They are, dude, yeah, 11.47% yield. And I don't know. I thought they cut the dividend, didn't they? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, double check that. I'm fairly certain. I don't want to scroll through and keep you guys hanging here. But, yeah, really nervous when they were working on torpedoes. On Oh, dude, how many Navy people do we have in here? So uh, what were you, Marcus? I don't remember torpedoes dude we got a lot of sailors in here you friggin scabs how many of you are polywogs i gotta know i need to know and i need to know right now and this is gonna be above a lot of people's heads but for all of you sailors here who of you is a freaking wog i gotta know i gotta know look at this bu2 uh i don't oh my god dude this is so bad os Oh, I don't remember what OS was. Um, operations specialists and BU. Boy, uh, was that a mechanical rate, man? 
I, I don't remember. By the way, I am not a wog. I am. <laughs> here we go. What has two thumbs and is a shell back? This guy. That's right. Uh, Maiden Voyage, we did that. I'm a shell back. And for those of you not watching, our, <laughs> how do you like that? So for you, this is for all of you not watching. Those of you watching, I'm not really talking to you, but I'm talking to you in particular that is not watching this video. What kind of an insane world is that? But, um, oh, CB, Construction Battalion. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so when you cross the line, the, we call the equator the line. They have a crossing the line ceremony. And you go through King Neptune's court, the oldest shellback, that's an officer, I believe is what it was on the boat becomes King Neptune. Somebody becomes Davy Jones. I don't remember who, how that worked in there. Um, and dude, what is with all we, we got a ton of Navy guys in here. Apparently I'm the Navy channel too. Uh, <laughs> so you go through King Neptune's story. The whole day kind of turns into like a pirate ship. There's, I don't know what they do anymore, but now they put food on you and you, you so all the polywogs, the people that are the sailors that are going to become shellbacks. Dude, look at this. Michael's a shellback too. Yeah. I, and I know a lot of you guys are dropping out, so that's fine. This is the end of the show anyway, but I'm enjoying this because I didn't realize there was so many Navy veterans in here. Um, yeah. So anyway, you go through a ceremony and you become a shellback. So I'm a shellback. Uh, there's some people that never cross the line or it takes them <laughs> many years. And uh, I love it, guys. So, um, yeah. So that's anyway, that's that's what I'm doing with the portfolio. I am going to be optimizing for the tax advantage. Would you guys do anything like that? Um, are you going to look and see if you have any overlap or do you not care? Uh, again, somebody on Twitter hit me up and said, dude, they're like, you can never have too much Johnson and Johnson, but you know, I just think there's a better opportunity. And those are companies that like Berkshire buys the big companies. And I was talking about it with Casey who didn't, uh, Oh man, dude, look at this. Bob is a Vietnam vet. Very nice, Bob. 16 months on shore Vietnam. Yeah, that's an, I, I don't even know. <laughs> and a shell back. I love it. Um, what was the thought I was wrapping up here with? Oh, I don't know, guys. I don't know anymore. What was it? What was it? Uh, I think it's gone. <laughs> it's, it's gone. But uh, yeah, if somebody wants to remind me. Oh, um, yeah. Buffett said if they had under a million dollars, he would be able to likely compound that portfolio at 50% a year because there's so many more opportunities available. And the bigger you get, the less opportunities there are. And when they buy a stock, they can't buy any more than 5% of it because it will just drive the price. It'll mess with the price. So they're really limited in how they can buy. And then obviously they have to report it. And when people see they're buying it, it then people jump on and it just starts driving up the price. So it's uh, it's very difficult for Berkshire to buy a small company. Like if, if Warren wanted to buy with Berkshire, wanted to buy a company that had a, I don't know, a $10 million market cap, how do they do that? How would you, you know, it doesn't make sense. They would end up just buy the whole company. Like it'd be like pocket change. So Palo is going to buy two more shares of Palo Alto. That's a company I'm not that familiar with. So interesting guys. So I don't know what you guys are doing today, but yeah, again, if you haven't, I, I enjoyed writing this free, uh, my life, love and investing. It's just super easy. You can't see this, but they're all like two sentences, three sentence, one sentence lines. And it's in the description below. Again, sign up for that. You'll get the newsletter. You don't want the newsletter? I don't know. Unsubscribe and get the free PDF. If you, there's stuff in there, you can go on Facebook and tweet out. You know, people like it. You want to tweet out some smart sounding stuff? Go to that and do it. So uh, it is, dude. Not Cowboy Curtis, but um, it is a weird thing. I play that. But you know what? I don't care. I love it. It just makes me happy. I love hearing that music. And uh, yeah, you are right, man. It's going to be time for that. So I will play one thing, though, before that. I will tell you people, speaking of Canada. Canada! Canada! 
Canada. Yeah, so that's uh, that's what we did with that. It's that time, guys. I, I thank you all for tuning in. If you just dropped in, please go back to the front. You can see what I did and why I did it. Threw together a nice little presentation for all y'all. There is a method to the madness. And um, yeah, please don't be a stranger. And uh, I do thank you guys for stopping on by. And um, I'll see you next week. So long, everybody.